Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening's live stream event. My name is John. I am the tattoo historian. And tonight I'm joined by Gerald Holland. He is a PhD student at the at Liberty University, and he is the co-founder of the Williamsburg Yorktown American Revolution Roundtable. And this is his first live stream event. So thank you, Gerald, for being on and, and trying this out with me. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And, and uh, Everyone will see me reaching over here. I'm checking out your comments and questions as we go along, just in case you have any. Uh, but the title of uh, the talk tonight is uh, The Revolution in Hampton Roads, 1775. And I know a lot of you have been hearing a lot of Civil War history, so it's nice to mix this up a little bit. So thank you for thank you again, Gerald, for uh, wanting to do that. And, and this is a really cool topic that you brought up. And uh, you want to talk a little bit about your background first? Uh, sure. Um, well, right now I'm in the Coast Guard. Uh, I just passed my 18-year mark, so I'm approaching retirement and trying to figure out uh, where my life is going to go next, uh, preferably within the history field. Um, before I worked, at, before I joined the Coast Guard, I was actually one of the uh, historic interpreters up at Colonial Williamsburg, and uh, my family's uh, history. Uh, dates back to the colonial period uh, to Jamestown up through the revolution. In fact, uh, the Travis House, which is across from uh, the public hospital, was my fifth great grandfather's. And we'll get to him here shortly with this 1775 story. Um, but down the street, Bassett Hall, uh, famous for the Civil War period, uh, my third great grandfather owned that during the Battle of Williamsburg. So history is in my blood. Um, it's what I'm good at, I think. Yeah. <laughs> what I want to do with my life. So. That's awesome. That's awesome. What, I, did, what did you do as an interpreter? Um, I did a first-person interpretation of a uh, indentured servant named Isaac Gelding. Um, if you go to the digitized Virginia Gazettes through the uh, Rockefeller Library at Colony Williamsburg. Uh, you'll find a runaway ad for Isaac Gelding, and the description physically is, at the time, it was me to a T. The, the brownish colored hair, the, the height, the build, everything except the moles. <laughs> so, and wow. then I did also uh, the uh, slave uh, community out at Carter's Grove, and the Capitol building, the Raleigh Tavern, things like that. Wow. Wow. So yeah, history does uh run through your veins and it's good yeah. to know your 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 family history in that area as well. Yeah, we've uh we've been around for a while. There you go. Yeah, I've I've I'm the same way. I have mine traced back to the sixteen sixties in Massachusetts. So it's we're we're we've been here a while. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. But I, when when you when you first reached out and want, wanted to talk about this topic, I was um, I didn't know much about this topic at all. Uh, I've been to the area, but I've never really gotten hardcore into the revolution in that area from the early part of the revolution. So when you reached out and said about the the revolution in Hampton Roads in 1775, I was like, we we have to do this. This is this is something that I don't know a lot about. And I like to have people on who are a lot smarter than me about things. So, so I, I love learning new stuff. So this is going to be a, a great way to do that. Yeah. Well, when people think of the revolution in Virginia, they usually think about Yorktown, mm -hmm. but there's a lot more to what we did here than just Yorktown. Mm -hmm. I mean, prior to Yorktown, you had Arnold uh, invading Virginia and wreaking havoc up through Richmond yeah, Cornwallis and Lafayette dancing across central Virginia. Uh, Cornwallis almost capturing Jefferson at Monticello. So th there's a lot more than Yorktown that we have going on in that period. Yeah, what's, what is the area around Hampton Roads like right before this incident we're going to talk about, right before 1775? What's the, how, what's the environment like in the area? Um, well, I live in the town of Newport News, which at that time was called Warwick County. Um, and it pretty much ran the same sort of map lines as it does now. Uh, Warwick County would have run up the James to James City County in York County, then on to Williamsburg. Um, the rest of the peninsula, you had Elizabeth City County and the town of Hampton. 
uh, Elizabeth City County is now known as the town of Picosan. And for the Hampton Roads area, on the south side, you had uh, Norfolk and Portsmouth uh, and Princess Anne County, which is now Virginia Beach. And then down to the Dismal Swamp and then, you know, Surrey County, uh, Smithfield, uh, Isle of Wight County and so forth. Was but it was the, it heavily uh, inhabited, Gerald, in that area, or was it pretty sparse? Um, the town of Hampton was pretty well inhabited. Um, Williamsburg, the capital, up until 1780, I believe had around 2,000, 2,500 people. Wow. And then the rest was kind of sp spread out. Uh, Yorktown uh, was known as the town of York, not Yorktown. Um, and I don't recall what the population was there, but it was a pretty busy port. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems like uh, I, I read your article, the the seizure of the Virginia Gazette or no Norfolk Intelligence Intelligencer. Wow, I need more coffee apparently. Uh, <laughs> and the and the Journal of the American Revolution. And I can post a link for my uh, my peeps on there if you guys want to check this out. This is a great article, and it it really to me was uh, when you when you brought the subject and you sent me the link. It really focused on the power of the press literally <laughs> you know, the printing press, but the power of the press in that, in that area. Uh, what, what was that basically like as we get into what we're going to talk about this evening? What was that communication like? Well, the Virginia Gazette had uh, four separate editions being published, uh, three out of Williamsburg and one, the uh, title of the article, out of Norfolk. Uh, I would I would consider the one out of Norfolk to be kind of a, uh, a private enterprise uh, based on the way it was uh, purchased and uh, founded by John Hunter Holt, who uh, operated the paper from March 75 until uh, the press was seized at the end of September 75. Um, Holt's father uh, was very well connected in New York and New England with uh, Samuel Adams and the Sons of Liberty. And it appears that uh, funding from those uh, individuals uh, was able to pay for the purchase of the uh, Norfolk Intelligencer down in Norfolk. Um, and with that, it basically, basically became a uh, very pro-patriot uh, newspaper, along with the uh, normal advertisements and uh, articles from different cities and towns uh, from the colonies and in Europe and such. Uh, the other Virginia Gazettes out of Williamsburg, um, they were, so there was, a, I think I've referenced it in the article, uh, through the House of Burgesses, they basically had the Gazette as the, uh, the paper for the uh, government. Mm -hmm. So that the news for what the Burgesses uh, did and you know, bills and such like that uh, could be advertised throughout the colony. But uh, I find the uh, the in intelligencer story to be more fun. That's why I wrote the article. Yeah, let let's get into that because that's that's a really cool thing. And uh, what was there any kind of? I know that the revolution. A lot of people think is revolution. Every colonist is behind it. Obviously not. There are loyalists, and there are those who don't want anything to do with it. Are there any printed uh, papers that were more? loyalist than this or what in this area was it generally just the what who's connected to who as far as um, in this area it was mostly uh patriot papers okay um i haven't found any in the hampton roads area that mm -hmm. were loyalist connections but there were loyalists in this area uh, the scottish merchants out of uh suffolk um norfolk was very pro uh, loyalist eccentric and on the uh, eastern shore of Virginia, I had a lot of loyalists, loyalists as well. Um, eventually, when Governor Dunmore uh, goes up to Gwynn's Island, which is in Matthews County, uh, he encounters um, a good loyalist support up there as well, until he, uh, until he flees to head back to England to join his wife and children. So tell us about the intelligence, sir. This is an amazing story. <laughs> All right. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, John Hunter Holt was the son of John Holt, uh, who printed a pro-patriot newspaper out of New York City. And ironically, uh, he, 
he was run off by the British when they uh, ransacked New York in 76. Um, unlike uh, his father, Holt never brings the press back up in Virginia. Uh, his father, John, uh, sets up shop again in, uh, I think, I forget the name of the towns in New York, but he sets up shop at least two or three more times. And uh, when he dies, he's actually buried at St. Paul's, uh, where General Richard Montgomery is buried. Hmm. And uh, you can't read the headstone, but it, it's there on the back side of the church. So uh, the Norfolk Intelligencer uh, comes about uh, the purchase, I think around March 75. And John Hunter Holt immediately begins pro-patriot uh, press. Um, by the time Dunmore flees Williamsburg and the British uh, warships are raiding the plantations and, you know, towns up and down the James River and York River, uh, Hunt or uh, John Hunter Holt is uh, now expressing his views and a more uh, vocal He's not afraid to tell what he thinks. Um, he refers to Captain Matthew Squire as a Negro catcher. Hmm. Uh, that's right from the paper. Hmm. Sorry if I offended anyone with, with the word Negro. Um, he even goes to a point where uh, after the hurricane of September uh, 75 um, to accuse Captain Matthew Squire of bestiality. Wow. So... <laughs> It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting take when you really get into them. And uh, for anyone who's interested, the Norfolk Intelligencer newspaper is digitized. It's, uh, you can Google it. It's through the College of William and Mary. It's in a PDF format. I have it saved on my computer for quick access, mm -hmm. but anyone can look through it. And it, it only runs from March through the end of September 75. Wow. So it's almost got a, it almost has a, uh, almost like a tabloid air to it where, where they're talking about people in that way, where he's saying that there's bestiality going on and all that stuff to try to, to try to smear him, you know? Yeah. It was, uh, when I, when I got into the Norfolk Intelligencer version of the Virginia Gazette and the back and forth, uh, correspondence between Squire and Holt, Squire and the town of Hampton, uh, done more and it almost seemed like a, a really bad uh, midday Fox News <laughs> mm -hmm. but it was fun to read because you wouldn't expect that kind of language from the 18th century mm -hmm. it, was, it was a little bit more prim and proper but at the same time you could get away with uh, insults and in, in your own way yeah it's kind of like uh Kind of like when someone watches like uh, an English drama and and they they make a snot remark to someone in their face, but it, it's so nicely put that they don't take it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, when I worked at Williamsburg, one of the things that we liked to do was uh, we used a it's called the Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue, mm -hmm. and it's basically street slang from the period. And we liked to utilize words on occasion for, for visitors if they got on our nerves. This was back in 2000, so don't worry. I don't think it happens now, but um, we tried to make it authentic. And based on what I've seen in the newspapers uh, for this research, it's, uh, it's pretty close. Yeah. What about uh, Dunmore doesn't really stick around long, does he? he no, so D Dunmore, you got to love him and you got to hate him. Um, I, I kind of hate him because I'm a patriot. But uh, so Dunmore, he returns from uh, the Western Virginia area towards the end of 1774. And he's a hero. He's uh, negotiated a very pro-Virginia treaty with the Native Americans. He's come back to Williamsburg. He's triumphant. And then within a month or two, he's the worst guy in, in the colony. Um, he was very loyal to the crown. And he took, uh, took the words from a letter that the Lord uh, Earl of Dartmouth wrote in uh, January 1775, uh, basically saying that uh, governors had the responsibility 
to ensure that Patriot or Rebels uh, were not able to have arms or gunpowder at their uh, disposal. Uh, so, and ironically, yesterday was the 245th anniversary of the gunpowder incident, <laughs> where uh, gun, uh, Dunmore has some British Marines from the HMS Magdalene, which was uh, moored up just down the James at, uh, at Burrell's Landing. Uh, B-U-R-W-E-L-L. I pronounce things a little funny with my Virginia voice. <laughs> So at Burroughs Landon, the HMS Magdalen, under the command of uh, Lieutenant Henry Collins, uh, he sends some British Marines into Williamsburg at around two in the morning on the 21st of April, two days after Lexington, which was due in part to the seizure of gunpowder. And the British Marines walk, uh, break into the magazine, take off with 15 half barrels gunpowder. Um, and that kind of sparks the war period of the revolution here in Virginia. Um, a month and a half later on June the 8th, Dunmore fearing for his life, his family's life, and he's frankly just kind of fed up with residents of uh, Williamsburg. He uh, heads, he flees the governor's palace in the middle of the night on June the 8th, uh, gets on board the HMS Magdalen now on the York River out at Queens Creek and they sail him down to Yorktown where he gets onto a, uh, the HMS Bowie and then sails down to Norfolk and spends the rest of his time in Virginia uh, planning, operating, con and uh, conducting uh, raids on plantations, uh, towns, uh, in, most, in most ways to take supplies from the Patriots and uh, to capture uh, slaves so that they could not be used uh, for the Patriot cause as well. Um, ultimately, come November, uh, Dunmore wants to uh, arm the slaves that he has uh, stolen. And at, at the same time, he wants to uh, free those who are willing to join his forces. So on November 17th, uh, 75, he issues his Emancipation Proclamation, you could call it, uh, offering that to the slaves and indentured servants. Hey, come join my forces, support the crown, you're guaranteed freedom at the end of this thing. Mm -hmm. um, not overly successful, uh, I believe about two or 300 uh, enslaved individuals joined his ranks and some did fight at the Battle of Great Bridge a month later. Didn't he, did he, uh, I thought I read, Gerald, maybe it was in your article that he used uh, a captured printing press to print out that decree. Was that for that reason or is that another thing that he had done, done more? Um, that would be the press of John Hunter Holt that he okay. uh, printed his, right. his own form of the Virginia Gazette, uh, a fifth version. Uh, he printed that from the vessel that he was embarked upon uh, for the rest of the year. What, what about that? Uh, you said that they had a hurricane in 1775. I, I never heard of that before. So that's really interesting to me. So. Yeah. So uh, there's actually a book called the hurricane of independence uh, details, the hurricane. Um, I forget the name of the author at the moment, um, but he's a, he's from Williamsburg. Right. And for Virginia's part of the hurricane, um, it hit Hampton Roads on September 2nd. And unlike today, where we have the forecast and all that good stuff, um, really the only news of the paper of the hurricane was what was printed in the newspapers. Hmm. Um, it wreaked havoc through, through the Virginia Peninsula, up through the Chesapeake Bay and continued northward, kind of like what Sandy did a few years ago. Right. Uh, continued northward up through Pennsylvania, New Jersey, into New York, um, and just continued to wreak havoc. Um, for its part in Virginia, um, that's where the story gets really fun. Uh, because um, in my old home, in my old hometown of Pocosin, uh, we have what's called Back River. And at the mouth of Back River, Captain Matthew Squires 
his vessel, the HMS Liberty, was grounded on the beach. And because of Squire's reputation from the summer and conducting raids and such, uh, the folks of Hampton uh, didn't take too kindly to Captain Squires. And they, uh, they noticed that, hey, there's a British warship on our beach. Let's go check this out. So uh, Squires had actually uh, abandoned ship and was holed up in what was uh, considered to be slave cabins close to where his uh, vessel was at. But the uh, folks from the town of Hampton and uh, Elizabeth City County uh, went over to the ship and basically ransacked it. They uh, took off naval stores, they took off uh, armament, um, you name it, if, if they could move it, they took it. And when Squires gets back to a ship, hey, nothing's here. So a week later, he uh, writes a letter printed in the Gazette to the town of Hampton in Elizabeth City County and says, hey, I want my stuff back. <laughs> um, and he lists everything that they took and it's in print. Um, it was a lot of stuff. And he basically says, give me my stuff back or I'm going to burn the town of Hampton. And a couple of days later, the citizens of Hampton on the town committee, they say, okay, here's the deal. We'll give you your stuff back if, and then they had a list of their own demands of things that they wanted returned. More, more importantly, they wanted all of the slaves that had been taken from local plantations to be returned. That was like their number one thing. Mm -hmm. And there was no agreement uh, between the two parties. And by the end of October, uh, Dunmore and Squire had, again, been fed up with the town of Hampton. And that brings on what's uh, known as the Lexington of the South, the Battle of Hampton, uh, October 25th and 26th of uh, 75. And I never heard of that. So that's because we're in a day with Lexington and Concord all the time. And especially now because the anniversary just happened. Uh, so what, what was the Battle of Hampton? So the Battle of Hampton. Uh, so the Hampton River is a tributary of the James, uh, just off the mouth of the Chesapeake. And on the evening, morning of the 25th, uh, several uh, British warships sailed into the mouth. Uh, to bombard to bombard and set fire to the town. Um, apparently, the Patriots had received word that this may take place. So the uh, folks in Williamsburg, the, the uh, now the delegates of the convention, uh, issued orders to Colonel William Woodford to bring down the Culpeper riflemen and uh, set up for the defense of. Norfolk, Portsmouth, and Hampton. Um, by the time they got here, they were ready to defend Hampton. And the way the, the way the town of Hampton sits coming in through the river, um, coming through the river, and now you have marinas and a big hotel and such. Well, there on the shoreline was an open uh, field of fire at the British ships. Mm -hmm. And a squire led the, the ships into uh, close proximity to uh, the town, the riflemen on shore were able to basically just pick off uh, sailors and Marines from the British ships until Squire uh, the next day uh, decided enough's enough, we're gonna, we're gonna back out of this thing. Hmm. So how long does this battle actually last? Because it seems like they are caught off guard immediately by these riflemen on the, on the banks. Yeah, so uh, the dates for it are October 25th and 26th. Okay. Um, I believe the evening of the 25th and then a lull in the action. And then again, uh, again pops off on the 26th until uh, Squire decides to, to call things off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not, a, it's not really a grand engagement, yeah. but it's the first engagement uh, between Virginia forces and British forces in Virginia. Hmm. So it is like a, yeah, it is like a shot heard around the world for Virginia. In that yeah, region. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what's with it with everything going down with the press and Squire being labeled all kinds of things in the press? I think I read in your article where 
he's labeled a, a, a coward and a thief for uh, a saucy coward, which I really appreciated that terminology. Uh, <laughs> it's great yeah. colonial terminology, a saucy coward. Uh, they, they really label him as like a, almost like a beast himself where he's like not even gentlemanly at all. There's nothing about him that they want around the area and and uh, he seems to be an interesting character in, in that part of the world. Yeah, Squire, I've been I've been digging and digging to try to find a journal from Squire because I really want to read his point of the, his side of the story right. because it's so interesting. Um, he was hated just as much as Dunmore and the two acted in, in court uh, so much up and down the rivers and the uh, other tributaries that by the time the hurricane struck and uh, his vessel was grounded. He was a very hated individual. Mm -hmm. um, and like I mentioned, he was he, he was called a Negro stealer mm -hmm. because that's what he was doing. And in that time point, in that period, slaves were, you know, property. Mm -hmm. So he was essentially a thief. Mm -hmm. And the Patriot folks around here uh, didn't take too kindly to it doesn't seem like it they gave him a lot of uh trouble in the in the press in that area yeah, it's, it, 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 it was just it's just so fun to read that uh how accessible are those records are they very accessible are they digitized or are they still housed in you know one location or yeah. do you have to travel to different areas to find these kind of records um the all the newspapers are digitized um, the three newspapers out of Virginia or the out of Williamsburg uh, are digitized through the Rockefeller Library out of Colonial Williamsburg. Okay. And the Norfolk Intelligencer is in a PDF format from William and Mary. Okay. So very, very accessible. It's, that's a lot something that my followers, uh, a lot of them are, you know, research enthusiasts um, or, or their students themselves, just as you're you're a doctoral student, I'm soon to be a doctoral student. We wonder where we're finding these primary sources at and are they digitized as you have to travel and, and such like that. But it's very good to know that these are digitized so we can go in there and see how they actually perceived the Battle of Hampton, perceived the hurricane that came up through there because that's something that you don't hear about a lot in the 18th century is what they talk about with hurricanes or tornadic activity and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, the, the most uh, weather-centric person of the period that I can think of is Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. I mean, he kept weather records daily at Monticello. Mm -hmm. But for events like this, they're not in the books. Mm -hmm. the, you kind of, I mean, I, I didn't know about it until I was doing some other research in John Selby's The Revolution in Virginia, which is an excellent book, by the way. Um, and then, you know, as a researcher, you go to the bibliography and the notes and you see where, do, where did this come from? And then you find it yourself. And luckily for me and for other researchers of this period, the newspapers are digitized and you can uh, go to them and see for yourself exactly what was wrote, uh, what exactly the feelings were of the people and the correspondence between the differing parties and I, I would reference and say the bickering parties um, in this uh, particular time period. What What do you think is the kind of the legacy of the Battle of Hampton, Gerald? Was it was it a, a defining moment for Virginia as a colony in that regard, or uh, did the British perceive it a certain way and they they kind of held back, or what do you think it was? Um, now, this is just my opinion on this one, but I think it opened the eyes of Virginians that the revolution was now a very real thing. Mm. It wasn't just uh, a bunch of petitions to the king and, you know, conventions being held with great speeches and, and congresses and things like that. It was now a very real thing. And especially with news of Lexington and Concord not reaching Virginia, I believe a week, week and a half after the event, 
So around, let's see, 20, 26th of April, 30th of April, thereabouts. Right about there, yeah. So it hit home. Mm -hmm. And you have, a, again, you have a lull in the action from the Battle of Hampton. And then in December of, uh, early December, I believe December 9th, you have the first land battle between British and uh, Patriot forces at the Battle of Great Bridge. Uh, down near the Dismal Swamp going into North Carolina, um, ends up being a Patriot victory. And after that, British, uh, British military presence here in Virginia was non-existent until 1779, when uh, Sir George Collier sends a raid, or Sir Henry Clinton sends George Collier and uh, Captain Matthews down to the Chesapeake to attack Portsmouth and, and Norfolk and take, basically destroy the shipyard here. And again, that opens the eyes of Virginians to, hey, we've been pretty safe for the last three years. Now we're being attacked again because the mouth of the Chesapeake is wide open and we have no defenses. So it's certainly, uh, the Battle of Hampton and Great Bridge didn't set Virginia up to prepare itself because come 1779, the British just walk right in the door. Hmm. And again, they do it again in 1780 and then into the Yorktown campaign. Do you think, I know this is a, a another opinionated question, but as historians, we sometimes have to interpret things as, as we would say. Do you think that uh, Virginia's hearing the news from other theaters quote unquote of the war and they're just focused on that for four years and they just don't realize that something is going to happen in their back backyard um how, why do you think that is why do you think they're caught flat-footed um well if you look at the campaigns of the first few years of the war um they basically move from boston and they make their way south as far south as Philadelphia and uh, southern Pennsylvania. Um, during the Philadelphia campaign, uh, William Howe sends some ships up the Delaware through the head of Elk uh, to attack Philadelphia, where he easily could have come down a little further and come up through the mouth of the Chesapeake and ransacked Virginia while going into Pennsylvania at the same time. Um, Virginia, for its part, at that period was kind of like what the Shenandoah was during the Civil War. Virginia was the breadbasket. They provided a vast amount of the men, vast amount of the supplies, and uh, the tobacco crop from the colony was being used to pay for uh, French arms and Europe other European arms to supply the Patriots. Um, but they didn't have a very milit militaristic posture because that's not what they were uh, needed for at the, at the moment. Was, uh, was the area pretty, was there a split in the area as far as loyalists and, and patriots or rebels or whatever you wish to call them, depending on our, our viewership, because I know we have some Canadians watching, so they will call, <laughs> call them rebels. Um, but was there, was there kind of an even, or not even split, but was there a divide that was apparent because we sometimes hear that uh, the revolution was fought in thirds, like a third of the country mm -hmm. was rebel, a third was loyal, a third didn't want anything to do with any of it. Uh, did you see that in the, in that area of Virginia or did these events kind of make it more um, one way or another, let's say? So one of the, and, and this was one of the stories that we talked about when I worked at Williamsburg, was the uh, split between the Randolph family. Um, Edmund Randolph uh, eventually becoming the first attorney general of the uh, United States. His uncle Peyton Randolph, the first president of the Continental Congress. Um, Peyton Randolph's brother, John, was the attorney general of Virginia at the time when Dunmore was still governor and the family split. Uh, John Randolph remained a loyalist and actually uh, sailed back to England with Dunmore and his family. Uh, Peyton Randolph would, would die in 75, 
but Edmund Randolph would have a very prominent role as uh, one of Washington's aides de camp. And then within the uh, conventions and the uh, House of Delegates here in Virginia. Um, other uh, towns in, Virgin in the Hampton Roads area, uh, Norfolk had a very uh, prominent loyalist population. Um, I actually just finished writing a, a couple of articles for uh, th the Trafalgar Chronicle and one's on Nathaniel Portlock. Uh, the Portlock family out of Norfolk, uh, they were loyalist and uh, they fled back to England. Uh, Nathaniel Portlock actually uh, joins the Royal Navy and ends up sailing after the revolution with, uh, with uh, Lord Nelson. Oh, wow. Um, and he was also sent on an expedition to explore the uh, Pacific Northwest and Alaska to open up the fur trade for Great Britain. Hmm. So you have the Portlock family, you have the Randolphs, um, Suffolk and Norfolk had a lot of Scottish merchants that remained loyal. And when Dunmore, or you might say the Patriots, uh, burned the town of Norfolk um, on New Year's Day, 76, uh, a lot of the loyalists have by then fled and had embarked ship with Dunmore for safety. And like most of the loyalists out of New York, uh, they end up sailing back to uh, back to Great Britain. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, ask you about the uh, the round table because you're the co-founder of, as I said at the beginning, Williamsburg, Yorktown, American Revolution round table. And uh, I just wanted to touch on that for a little bit because it's a really interesting thing to talk about round tables in this day and age uh, before the, the pandemic and everything, all of us coming together at different historical organizations and, and hanging out with fellow nerds and just having a good time and, and all that <laughs> stuff. Uh, what, when, when was that uh, organization founded and, and what, what's the mission of the Williamsburg Yorktown American Revolution Roundtable? Um, the, the Roundtable was founded in February, 2014. Um, the closest one to the Yorktown Williamsburg area was in Richmond. And for me, that's about a 90 minute, maybe two hour drive with traffic. Mm -hmm. I just don't have time to do it with a wife and kids and school and work. I didn't have time to drive to Richmond for a nerd meeting, you might say. Well, what my wife would say anyways. <laughs> so uh, I made some email inquiries to the folks in Richmond and said, hey, this is who I am. How do I start this thing down where I'm at? And I worked with uh, Dr. Sean Huvel out of uh, Christopher Newport University, which is my alma mater. And uh, he and I met at some coffee shops uh, at Panera Bread. Uh, we met with a few other folks, put our heads together. And the very first meeting we had, we expected hey, maybe 10 people was going to show up to this thing. We ended up having almost 50 to 60 people. Wow. And it was almost like, a, like the scene at the end of uh, It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> where everyone's throwing money at George Bailey. Yep. Everyone was throwing up, uh, you know, membership applications and checks and cash at us. And we turned and looked at each other like, what's going on? What did we just do? Mm -hmm. um, and now six years later, we're still going strong. Um, because of my Coast Guard duties, I had to step back from my role within the round table. Uh, but now we have a very strong board that has some top-notch speakers. Uh, we meet at the brand new uh, Revolutionary War Museum in Yorktown. So we have a really great home. Mm -hmm. um, and through up and down the East Coast, we have round tables from Lexington down to South Carolina. And you can find a list of those on the Journal of the American Revolution. Um, closest one to you up in Pennsylvania, I believe is in Lehigh Valley. Okay. Um, a ways off. <laughs> yeah, but you know they're up and down the East Coast, and every year they have a, a round, round table Congress, which is kind of like a Continental Congress, you might say. And they meet it. Last year they met at Philadelphia. Uh, the year before that they met in Yorktown. Um, so they hit a historic city each time, mm -hmm. and it's a very well connected network of individuals. If, if you need a question answered you can make a contact. Um, but our, our mission 
um, when I when I started the, the round table, I wanted one somewhere to go and listen to people talk about this the topic. But we cover the period 63 to the constitutional period. Um, and if you're interested in speaking on something and it's related to the era, we'll more than likely uh, entertain. Yeah. Um, but, you know, from, from what I wanted to do with it, you know, I wanted to kind of reach out to undergrad students and have them get involved more, which I think we're kind of working on. Um, but the connections, that's, that's the biggest thing. Um, one of my favorite stories from my, uh, so with the Coast Guard, I ended up uh, being stationed in New York for a few months. Sad time there. It was a vacation in New York. And uh, before I left, I made some emails and said, hey, who in New York can I talk to while I'm there to get some, some insight? I ended up hooking up with Jack Buchanan, author of The Road to Guilford Courthouse, yep. one of the best books of the revolution. Yep. Jack was a former registrar at the Met. So, you know, we, we, linked, we got together, we had dinner, and a couple of weeks later, I end up getting a personalized eight hour tour of the Met. Wow. Best time of my life. I bet. So, <laughs> you know, the, the connections are certainly well worth uh, the effort to put the round table together. Yeah. Yeah. How many, how many members do you have now? Um, at our last meeting back in February, we had about 50 people. Wow. So our membership, I think is around 40, 45. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if, if you're, if you want to come check it out, you're open to come check it out. And if you want to become a member, fill out the application. I think it's 25 bucks and you're good to go. Next time I'm down, I'm definitely going to check it out because I have, I love that area of the world anyway. Uh, but once, uh, once we're out of the mess we're in now, I'm, I'm definitely going to be out more and, and doing a lot. And I would love to come. I know some of my, my followers, I'm sure would love to come and some are Virginians. They should be there. <laughs> they should be getting involved. Yeah, one of the, uh, the, the, and we don't host the event itself, mm -hmm. but uh, through the Richmond Roundtable, uh, there's a, a history company called America's History LLC. Oh, yes. And they host a Revolutionary War round, uh, conference uh, every spring in March uh, down here in Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. And uh, it sells out every year. Um, unfortunately, because of this whole pandemic mess, I got canceled this year, mm -hmm. but they had speakers lined up, uh, Nathaniel Philbrick, um, James Kirby Martin. Uh, last year, they had Rick Atkinson with his new book series, The British Are Coming. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's a good time. It's, sounds like it. I'm going to have to hit that some year. <laughs> it sounds like a good time. Yeah. But when you when you reached out to me, Gerald, and, and asked about this uh that that whole area like i said earlier is untouched on my page so i really wanted to bring you on and and have you discuss this not only this era but that particular geographical region a lot more because it's really overlooked and the battle of hampton is definitely uh, at least for a lot of my followers overlooked including me uh you know it's growing up so close to gettysburg that's all we had and mm -hmm. it's really interesting to hear you talk about the American Revolution Roundtable and the size of it compared to the size diminishing of what I see in the Civil War Roundtable field. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of growth in in that area for you. And I'm wondering also if it's because we're coming so close to the 250s and people are getting really heavily involved in possibly pop history and more books and such is going to increase the the growth of, of that era. I yeah, hope. when I when I signed up to do my master's program a few years ago, I had the opportunity to either do the American Revolution or the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And if you can, you might not be able to see them behind me, but I got my portraits of Lee and Jackson because, well, you're a Virginian. They're, they're who I love. <laughs> and, and we're Virginians. Yeah. But I also have George Washington and uh, on the wall in front of me, I have uh, Washington Cross in the Delaware, mm -hmm. uh, the Boston Massacre and Yankee Doodle Dandy. Um, well, when I was signing up for the master's program, I was thinking to myself, I really love the Civil War, 
and I've really read a lot about it, but no one does the American Revolution. So I went with that one. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up getting a graduate certificate in the Civil War because I could, but now with the PhD, I'm focusing my uh, my studies on the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately my like big shebang goal for life, if I ever get into this history uh, stuff full time, is uh, up in Gettysburg, you guys have the Civil War Institute mm -hmm. at Gettysburg College. Right. Well, I want to create a similar version, but for the revolution. Mm. And uh, I emailed uh, Peter Carmichael, uh, I think last year, uh, to try to get an idea of the background of how the uh, Civil War Institute got started and uh, kind of give me a background of how to get this idea started on my end. Mm. Um, and, and part of the, the round table when I created it as well was because no one does the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, around here, it's Civil War, Civil War, Virginia, Civil War. Mm -hmm. But like we talked at the beginning, there was more than just Yorktown for the American Revolution in Virginia. And that's what I wanted to, to get out to the public. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's great. And as I said, I'm going to uh, send a link to my followers with the, with your, uh, the article that you sent me, and I'll be sure to send them a link to the, uh, the round table as well. I'll get a link from you about that and they can check that out as well. Cause I'm sure it's going to grow. And I'm sure a lot of my followers who are from Virginia are going to want to check in on that. But, uh, but Joe, I really appreciate you, you coming on here. I know this is your first live stream and, uh, and no, nothing went wrong. <laughs> so you didn't, we didn't lose lighting. You know, we didn't have some weird thing happen, but I know that my listeners got a lot out of it. And uh, I, I really appreciate you coming on and giving this a whirl, my friend. Hey, no problem. Um, very happy to do it. I appreciate you having me on. Um, working on a second article right now about the, uh, the second uh, British operation in Virginia. Um, in 1779, when uh, Henry Clinton sends uh, British warships to raid Portsmouth and, uh, and ransack the south side. So once I get that up and going, maybe we'll put this on here as well. Yeah. And, uh, then the rest of the stuff is the Yorktown, Yorktown campaign. And, you know, everybody's kind of familiar with that one. Right. But it's, it's the little stories of the period that I like to find in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, and one that I wanted to reference real quick was sure. actually a very personal story sure. because it's family related. Um, so my family background is the Travis family and uh, Champion Travis was a member of the uh, Fifth Virginia Convention, which declared Virginia's independence. Uh, he was also a commandant of the Virginia Navy um, his brother Edward was at the Battle of Great Bridge, and during this period with Dunmore making his raids and the Squire and all that sorts, um, in November of 1775, uh, the Travis family owned property up on Jamestown Island, and they lived, I believe, in the Ambler House. And on November 17th of uh, 75, British warships sailed up the James River. And because they knew that the Travis family were supporters of the Patriot cause and provided supplies and worked within the conventions and things like that, um, Captain Montague, I forget what ship he was on, uh, actually fired at the Travis household and destroyed the chimney. And where did I find this out at? The Virginia Gazette. <laughs> there you go. So yeah. it's the little stories that, that, that are interesting. It's, I mean, everybody likes the, the glamour and the glory of battles and generals and things like that. But I like this. I like the little stuff, mm -hmm. things that nobody knows about. Mm -hmm. Because that leads you into more research to find out more and make an article about it or, you know, make, a, make another story about it. So, right. Right. Yeah. And I'm going to reach out to you uh, here later. I have to look up his name. Uh, I told you earlier that I had some ancestors as far back as 1660 Massachusetts. Well, they slowly 
like the Northern campaigns and revolution, they slowly made their way South. And that's how we ended up in Pennsylvania, um, Maryland, and what would become the, the Northern part of Virginia colony. And mm -hmm. uh, when I was looking through my uh, ancestry, I located one person who is in Virginia. Uh, I, one part of the family who went to Virginia, uh, he's the only slaveholder in my family. Really? And he happened to serve in the seventh Virginia and during the okay. revolution. So I need to get more information <laughs> on those guys and find his name and get in touch with you because I do have multiple revolutionary war ancestors. All, all were, uh, were rebels. Uh, but, uh, mainly Pennsylvania, but I did have one Virginian. So there is Virginia blood in, in my revolutionary war timeline. So yeah. I'd be well, I'm kind of just the opposite. I, uh, I know all my Virginia ancestors who fought in the civil war, mm -hmm. got their names, regiments. Uh, one was wounded at Gettysburg. Uh, one was killed at second Manassas. But then I discovered on my grandmother's side, one Pennsylvania guy from Uniontown, um, and he ends up being very prominent in Uniontown with uh, the formation of the GAR up there. Oh, wow. um, his son, my great grandfather, ends up being uh, in the artillery in World War I. Um, I have his victory ribbon uh, behind me oh. on a shelf. Um, and from World War II, he was prominent in setting up the uh, kind of militia, you might say, of a uh, the Hampton Roads area to, you know, the, to support the war effort. Um, but that one Pennsylvania, the Smithley family, that's their last name. Um, that was our only connection to the North, huh. but um, they have a great story. Yeah. So we have the opposite. I have one connection to Virginia. You have one to Pennsylvania <laughs> and everyone else seems to stay congregated in one area. Exactly. Uh, that's great. But Gerald, thank you again for being on, my friend. I, I really appreciate you doing this, and especially since it's your first. You know, you got to get the first live stream out of the way. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm glad we got got to link up together. Yeah, absolutely. And and I appreciate all of you watching and and commenting. I'll go back through the comments too, and and we'll uh, we'll see what we can answer or or give the thumbs up to. Uh, but it's great to have some Revolutionary War history on here uh, for a change. Uh, tonight we're our tomorrow night we're back to civil war history again because pete carmichael's got another guest for us to come on and uh but but again gerald thank you so much for for being on the night and i really appreciate it all right thanks for having me and i hope to hope to see you again soon absolutely i'll be in touch all right have a good night everybody take care